uh, I must say this, that very often liberals in the United States, people who are not for Bush, uh, yes, liberals uh, in the United States, uh, accept with sort of qualifications here and there, but accept basically the, the, the Bush principles. And the, the reason for this, I think, is that 9-11 uh, had a very powerful psychological effect on, 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 on everybody in America. Uh, but I think there are many people in the United States, liberal intellectuals, who were really, I think, so affected emotionally by what happened on 9-11 that uh, I think it began to distort their thinking. I know they wouldn't like me saying this. Uh, distort their thinking about what was happening in the world and about America's role in the world. And, and they, were, they were sort of becoming hysterical uh, over terrorism. And again, yes, there's a reality of terrorism, but there's a difference between de dealing with terrorism in a, an intelligent and, and real way and becoming hysterical over terrorism in the way that l actually liberals in the 1950s, and those of you who know some of the history of, of, in, of the United States in the 1950s during the Cold War period, during what is called the McCarthy period, uh, you might remember that there were uh, not just McCarthy people, but liberal people, uh, Democrats, uh, who uh, reacted hysterically to, to what they considered the communist threat. I mean, to the point where Hubert Humphrey, who was a sort of a quintessential American uh, political liberal, uh, Hubert Humphrey suggested uh, the notion of uh, internment camps for dangerous people in the United States uh, in times of crisis. Uh, and, uh, and I think we're seeing, you know, something of the same phenomenon. Because I was reading in the, in the liberal magazine, the American Prospect, with the editors in their recent issue, they, uh, you know, they, they, their premise is that the greatest immediate threat to our lives and liberties are Islamic terrorists with global reach. Well. And therefore, when facing a substantial, immediate, and provable threat, the United States has both the right and the obligation to strike preemptively, and if need be, unilaterally, against terrorists or states that support them. Uh, preemptively, and if need be, unilaterally. Well, that is the Bush doctrine. And of course, uh, they qualify this by saying, facing a substantial, immediate, and provable threat. The problem is that those who decide whether a threat is, in fact, substantial, immediate, provable, people who decide that will not be the liberal intellectuals who formulated this, but the people who run the government of the United States. They will decide it just as Bush decided it when he decided to go to war in Afghanistan and when he decided to go to war in Iraq. No. And uh, so uh, this idea, these ideas of unilateralism and preemption, and, and uh, these, are, these, are, these are not new. The whole history uh, of uh, the United States in the world is a history of expansion based on these and, and, also, and rationales given like the rationales given today uh, when we go to war about spreading liberty and democracy and, and civilization. Uh, and, you know, we uh, declared war on Mexico in, in 1846 and again for the purpose of uh, sort of teaching civilization to the Mexicans. And then uh, we went into Cuba in 1898 and, uh, to bring liberty to the Cubans. And, uh, and in fact, there's, you know, there's always a... Uh, or a lot of times, a certain measure of truth to these statements. That is, we did expel Spanish domination from Cuba. We, we liberated the Cubans 
from Spain, but not from ourselves. Because once Spain was gone, the United States moved in, corporations moved in, the American military moved in, American wrote, rewrote the Cuban Constitution. Uh, but the rationale was, you know, we are f bringing freedom to the Cubans. And then, of course, going into the Philippines and, and uh, bringing civilization, as McKinley said, Christianity, he will, we will Christianize and civilize the Filipinos. Uh, and because uh, we, are, we, are, we are different, uh, we are better. There was, uh, at the time of the, of the invasion of the Philippines, the uh, American Secretary of War, Elia Root, said uh, sort of a very uh, classical statement of, of American exceptionalism. He said, the American soldier is different from all other soldiers of all other countries since the world began. He is the advance guard of liberty and justice, of law and order, and of peace and happiness. The American soldier is different. Well, of course, now, right now, immediately now, in the, in the wake of Abu Ghraib, in the wake of all these revelations coming out every day about torture uh, and uh, uh, atrocities and so on, uh, that's... Uh, doesn't sound right, but you might say, well, Root could not anticipate Abu Ghraib, but he didn't have to anticipate because at the time he was saying this, the United States was already committing atrocities and massacres in the Philippines uh, uh, by these American soldiers who were different from soldiers, you know, all over the world. And, uh, and our, our the history, uh, the history of, of American expansion in the world is not a history which is taught very much uh, in our schools or even in our colleges and universities. That is, it's, it's, uh, um, we have something called diplomatic history. Uh, that's a discipline. Discipline is diplomatic history, and that's what our history is. Very often, it's diplomatic history, and we diplomatically treat the uh, American, uh, you know, foreign policy in the world. Uh, because if if young people uh, in our schools learned the history of the United States expansion in the world, if they learned the history of the uh, massacres and invasions that accompanied American expansion in the world, uh, they could not possibly believe the President of the United States when he gets up uh, before the nation and says, we're going into this uh, uh, country to, for liberty uh, and democracy. This is Operation Enduring Freedom and so on. Uh, but that history is not there. And, and this misuse of history is, it continues to be perpetuated uh, by, by our political leaders and not really caught or criticized by that uh, part of the American culture which is supposed to check up on and criticize what the government does, that is the press, uh, the media. And so you, you, you have Bush, uh, appearing, as he did a couple of years ago, before the Philippine National Assembly and saying uh, to the Philippine National Assembly, uh, the, uh, I don't know, he said, America is proud of its part in the great story of the Filipino people. Together, our soldiers liberated the Philippines from colonial rule. Well, the people in the Philippine National Assembly sitting there uh, you wonder, it must have taken a lot of self-restraint to just sit there and, and listen to this, liberated the Philippines. 600,000 or so Filipinos died in this long war against the Filipinos. Uh, and at the end of it, when the United States was triumphant, it did not bring liberty to the Philippines. It brought decades and decades and decades of military dictatorship to the Philippines. Uh, uh, but uh, 
I remember um, there was a point, I don't know, about a year ago where the Mexican ambassador to the UN uh, said something undiplomatic about the United States and Mexico. Uh, he said something about how the United States uh, uh, has been treating Mexico as its backyard. He was immediately reprimanded by Colin Powell, who said that he, this man did not understand the history of U.S.-Mexican relations. Uh, and uh, in fact, he was soon removed from his post. That's how much clout we have. He was soon removed from his post uh, as Mexican ambassador uh, to the United Nations. Uh, so, uh, so yes, with, without that history, you might uh, you might actually believe Bush when he uh, says uh, in in his recent inaugural address that uh, it is uh, how did he put it? It is uh, the sort of the mission uh, of the United States. Uh, to spread liberty around the world. As he put it, spreading liberty around the world, as he put it, is the calling of our time. And if you read the newspapers, including the so-called liberal press, the New York Times and the Washington Post, right after the uh, Bush's inaugural address, you saw a flurry of, of uh, praise for what Bush had said, that, that if people were uh, in the editorial rooms of these newspapers were so eager to hear those words about spreading liberty in the world, and as if everything else that has been reported uh, from Iraq over the past two years uh, f is meaningless uh, in the light of these beautiful words uh, uttered by George Bush. Uh, but all I would have to do would be to just uh, with a very short memory, remember that a couple of days before Bush's inaugural uh, address, uh, a couple of days before that, there was a photo uh, in the New York Times, which some of you may have seen, it was that showed a, uh, an Iraqi girl uh, crouching, bleeding, and According to the caption, she was screaming uh, because her parents uh, had just been shot to death uh, by Americans firing on their car. Uh, and of course, the, you know, there's always, well, we w claim the military, we'll investigate. Oh, we, there were warning shots. How do you distinguish a warning shot from a shot? Uh, but in any case, uh, there's some, to me, this was some uh, remarkable juxtaposition of, um, but also a testament to the, to the loss of memory, even uh, a memory that can last a couple of days, uh, to see this uh, uh, eager acceptance of Bush's words ab about uh, liberty. Uh, and uh, this idea of uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, you were told I would speak for an hour, so <laughs> I'm taking advantage of every minute of it. You see, <laughs> because when I heard it, I said, "No, I'm not going to speak for an hour. Actually, I'm going to speak for two hours." Uh, but. Uh, um, what this idea of, of a special American dispensation in the world, what it leads to is a, an abrogation of all sorts of uh, responsibilities to the human race, to everybody else in the world. And it means that the, the United States is exempt from these responsibilities. Uh, when, when I, I told you about Mad, Madeleine Albright declaring that we have a right, if necessary, to be unilateral, when she said that, Henry Kissinger said, 
uh, uh, this principle of our right to take unilateral action, he said, should not be universalized. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good principle for us, but no, it shouldn't be universalized, no. And so there are all this, this, there's a long list of instances in which the United States uh, has declared itself exempt from a sort of international agreements and international laws and uh, the UN Charter and the, you know, the Convention on Biological Weapons, you know, which uh, was actually signed some years ago, but which didn't have any teeth, didn't have any force. And when it was proposed to enforce the, uh, the, this Convention on Biological Weapons a few years ago, the Bush administration said, no, no way. Uh, it, it wouldn't go along with that. And, and, you know, and I think most of us know the United States has not gone along with the hundred or more nations that have outlawed landmines. And just the other day, I, I spoke to, a, I listened to actually, a, and spoke with a presentation by a, a surgeon, an Italian surgeon, who for 15 years has been doing surgery on war victims in every possible war zone of the world. Most of the, most of the people he operates on, which includes a lot of amputations, are children. And much of that comes from landmines, a hundred million of which are strewn around the world. But the United States wants to be exempt from the notion that we should outlaw landmines. And of course we continue, you know, we, uh, things outlawed by, you know, the Geneva Convention and uh, Cluster bombs and napalm and and uh, and uh, so uh, well so what's the answer to, what's the answer to to this uh, uh, very dangerous notion of uh, uh, American exceptionalism of our, our right to do as we will in the world. Well, I, no, I guess, you know, the, the, I guess the answer is sort of obvious, and you know, the, the answer is that uh, those of us in the United States and in the world who don't accept this idea must uh, declare very forcibly and, and act very vigorously uh, uh, against this idea. Uh, and insist that the uh, ethical norms uh, that most decent people can agree on uh, uh, should be observed, uh, and, and that no country should be an exception uh, to the rules of morality in the world affairs, uh, and that uh, The children of the world should all be seen as part of a family, and that, and that uh, the children of Iraq or the children of China or the children uh, of anywhere in the world uh, have the same right to life as American children. Uh, I mean, those are very fundamental moral principles, which the, if our government doesn't uphold them, we must uphold them. Fortunately, there, there are people all over the world who, who want to uphold those principles and who oppose it when the United States does not. And we saw, you know, on February 15th, uh, 2003, uh, on the eve of the, of the invasion of Iraq, we saw that amazing moment when on one day, 10 to 15 million people around the world, uh, in 60, 70 countries around the world demonstrated uh, against that war. Uh, and we've, uh, so there, there are people all over the world who, who uh, do not accept the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, when last week the State Department issued its report on human rights abuses, some of you may have seen that in the newspapers, the State Department issued its report on, on, it does this every year, it lists countries which are guilty of torture and other abuses of human rights. And, uh, 
And so it lists you know, a bunch of countries. A number of those countries are countries which are allies of the United States. A number of those are countries to which the United States has sent prisoners. And you know, I think by now you know that this notion of extraordinary rendition, where we're, uh, we're not going to torture these people, we'll send them to countries which will torture them. And so the State Department issues this list of countries which have violated human rights. And then when the, when the report came out, there were uh, responses from around the world uh, which said, hey, there's one country which is missing from this list. And yes, what about the United States? And, what about, and, uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, a Turkish, a Turkish newspaper said, there's not even a mention of the incidents in Abu Ghraib prison, uh, no mention of Guantanamo. A newspaper in Sydney, Australia, uh, pointed out that uh, you know, the United States sends suspects. Remember, suspects are not people who've been tried and found guilty of anything, just people who are suspected of doing something, sends suspects to prisons in Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Uzbekistan, you know, countries that the State Department says uses torture. And uh, so uh, people around the world, yes, and here in the United States. And this is, uh, this is something that we very often are deprived of. We're not only deprived of history, we're very often deprived of immediate history because we're deprived of things that happen in this country that people are doing uh, that uh, we don't know about because this is a big country, and because, but that's, that would be an easy excuse that we're a big country and that's why we don't know about them. No, we don't know about these things that are happening uh, around the country, these uh, protests, these declarations of humanity. We don't know about them because they're not really reported. Uh, and uh, so you, well, you, you know, you, if you go to the internet, you might find out. Uh, if you <laughs> go to a rally, you might get some of this information. If you travel around the country, you might learn that, you know, uh, this coming weekend, there will be demonstrations in cities all over the country. There's going to be a demonstration in New Orleans. There's going to be a demonstration uh, in Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina. There, uh, and uh, there's a resistance movement in the United States to this war. And you see only the, the uh, superficial, you might say, recognition of this when you read public opinion polls which show that now about half the country uh, does not believe in the war. And if half the country does not believe in the war, then somewhere among that 50 percent, there must be many, many people who are actively opposing that war. And those people are, are, are in fact, engaged in protest uh, all over the United States. And what's perhaps most significant is that in the armed forces and in the families of the armed forces, uh, there is more and more uh, defection from this war. The uh, Iraqi veterans uh, f against the war uh, formed uh, in kind of uh, reprise of what we had during Vietnam, Vietnam veterans uh, against the war. And we have uh, military families speak out of the families of soldiers uh, uh, organizing and who now have thousands of members and GIs themselves, GIs in the field, and you read about instances of mutiny, and, uh, and GIs who, who say we, we don't want to, who've been to Iraq, who are being sent back, who don't want to go back, uh, and some of them go to Canada, and some of them get court-martialed. And uh, uh, this is important because I, I, think of, uh, I think of what Einstein said when, at the end of, after World War I horrified by that war and by the idea of war itself and by the knowledge that now modern warfare uh, would be indiscriminate and massive. Uh, and Einstein said, uh, wars will stop when men refuse to fight. Uh, uh, and so the, yeah, the refusal to fight 
and the refusal of families to let their kids fight, and the insistence of, of the parents of high school kids that they will not let recruiters come into the high schools and approach their kids, all of these things, uh, uh, these things are uh, consistent with what Einstein thought was ultimately the way that wars would stop. So I leave you with uh, uh, the idea that uh, we're not alone and that there are people all over the world and people in this country who uh, do not accept the idea of a special dispensation to do whatever we want in the world and who will insist on, on uh, uh, human equality of people everywhere. And I'm, uh, I think of uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the uh, abolitionist. And I think of what was on the masthead of his, of his anti-slavery newspaper, uh, The Liberator, and on his masthead uh, were the words, uh, my country is the world. My country men are mankind. Uh, a good thing to remember. Thank you.